Hello readers, I'm Amy and today we are going full nerd. So, many of us judge books by their covers. This cover is pretty, that's the edition that I want. This cover isn't so pretty. Maybe you don't want a mass market paperback, you want like the nice hardcover copy. Or you hate the film cover. Most of us judge books by their covers, whatever they may be. But do you judge a book by its font? Probably. And if you say no, you don't judge a book by its font, I want you to actually pause and think about that for a minute. I have just finished my typography class, or this is the last week of my typography class. So I am not an expert, but I've done a lot of learning on typography in the last eight weeks, and I loved every moment of it, even though it is something really difficult to study with like lots and lots of vocabulary. You'd be surprised how much vocabulary there is in the anatomy of letters, because yes, letter forms have anatomy. But anyways, take, for example, nonfiction or classics. A lot of people don't read nonfiction, a lot of people don't read classics. Not only can the language be a little bit dry or a little bit difficult to read in many of them, but the font, at least from what I've observed, tends to be different from more like pop culture books. Hey, don't eat the fireplace. I shouldn't have to tell my cat not to eat the fireplace. Anyways, I have some pages here, some writing utensils. I have my little sign thing that the letters are already flying around on. This video is just gonna be kind of a run through of some basics about letters and font and anatomy because I would love to do just a whole video series talking about books and their fonts and how it can determine a lot of what we read and what we enjoy. But rather than re-explain font anatomy in every single video, <laughs> I thought it would be easier to just dedicate a video to it. I don't think this is going to be particularly long. I'm going to be running through some very basic things that I can actually remember without having to look at a ton of notes. So let's go ahead and get started and take a look at what you may not have realized about font. So first I want to talk about kierning. I This is one of the first terms that I ever learned and I got so excited because the teacher that I tend to watch on Skillshare went to this typography conference and he took a picture of himself with a sign that says Kieran down for what? And I love it. It's a song reference and it's a Kierning joke. And then whenever I tell it, I'm like, oh my gosh, this guy is so funny. And everyone's just like, cool, Kierning, hilarious. I totally know what you're talking about. So. We're gonna talk about that right now. Here is my little sign thing, and we've got some different kiernings on here. Let me see if I can like, I dropped an eye. Whatever, we don't need the eye. So I'm gonna get the camera to focus on this for a bit. This, let me adjust the O here, is a pretty basic kierning. So you have some space in between each of these letters. Just enough space to kind of give them their own room, but it's still a very readable word. Here, with reading, we see the letters are really, really close. The strokes on the bottom, they're actually touching each other. These letters don't really have any space. They're getting a little bit crowded. It might be a little more difficult to read. And then here, with love, we have a really large kerning. I can fit like a finger in between each of these letters. That gives each of the letters a lot of space, but it doesn't necessarily make them easy to read. This type of kierning tends to be one that's a little more used because it's just easier on the eyes. You're not having to take a journey from letter to letter, and you're also not having the letters totally run into each other. Another thing that we can see an example of here is leading. Leading is going to be the space in between each line. Some books have really, really small leadings where like the bottom of one line might almost be touching the top of the next line. That can make it a little difficult to read. If you have taken any courses past junior high, you probably had to write a double-spaced paper. Double-spaced paper means that you are widening the leading so you have lots of space in between the letters. So double-spacing on a paper means that you have a lot of space going in between those lines. I think, I am not totally sure on this, I think the reason a lot of papers that you write after junior high have to be double spaced is to make it easier to correct because there are 
certain kinds of symbols and stuff that you can put on a paper whenever you're proofreading it, whenever you're correcting someone's paper. So I think that's a lot of what the spaces are for. I've always hated having to double space my papers and I didn't really know why until I started taking the typography class and it made me realize I just hate double spacing because of it's the amount of paper that you're going through, all of this space that you're wasting, these huge spaces in between the words that are just taking up so much of the page. It takes longer to get through because you have to take this huge leap from one line to the next line. It doesn't just, it doesn't flow as nicely. But I think, like I said, I think that's for correction reasons whenever you're in school. But correct me if I'm wrong on that because I didn't double check. So that is leading and kierning. I think they're fascinating. Um, another thing to think about, I'm not totally sure on this because I didn't have a chance to double check my vocabulary <laughs> before this, but justification I think is what it's called whenever you have different margins. So you see this has like a really short margin here and this one has a larger margin. That's going to be kind of the justification. How much space are you putting on either side of the words? There will be times when I'm trying to read a classic book where, let's say this is the page, and this is the justification. So my phone case right here, that's going to be where all the words are. You have some space on the top, you have some space on the sides, like it takes up a lot of it, but you see this space here is quite a bit larger than the space at the bottom of the page and the top of the page. And this can be really frustrating to me because it's like, why well, have such large margins? Because usually I find whenever you have really large margins on the side, you usually have really small font size and that makes it more difficult to read and that can be super super frustrating. And in looking at some classics, even some nonfiction, I'm like I don't really want to read this because the page setup is weird and it feels like it's making it more difficult for my eyes to read this. Which on that note, readability. We have serif and sans serif. There are many different kinds of fonts, but those are our two big basic ones. So I'm going to go ahead and illustrate those really quick. Actually illustrate. So here we have a page and we have the letter T. This is a sans serif T. This T is made out of two strokes and that's it. To turn this into a serif T, you add those fancy little lines on each of the edges. Apparently, I don't know if this is true because like research is still kind of being done on it, but they say that serif fonts are easier to read than sans serif fonts, which I find really interesting. So like Times New Roman, which is what we have to write all of our professional papers in, that is a serif font because it has these little tab things on the end of each of the strokes. This sans serif because it doesn't have any of that. It's not fancy. It's really plain. Um, a lot of block fonts aren't going to have the fancy serif edges on them. They're just going to be really simple strokes, really thick lettering. Something else that you might have is a swash. So that is going to be more with script fonts. Script fonts and handwriting fonts I think are really similar. That's going to be where you have like your elegant fonts and your like cursive fonts and stuff. So whenever you learn printing and whenever you learn cursive, you're learning like two different styles of font and you're learning, I think an, an important thing with those is that you're learning to read them. I, Growing up, I'm like, why are we learning all this stuff about cursive? I already know how to write. Why would I learn like a whole other way to write the alphabet? And after taking this typography class, I think a lot of it is just learning to read it and being able to express ourselves in more ways. Like there's more than one way to write the letter A. You wouldn't think so, but it's it's a style thing. We have so many different styles that we do these things. You might have the people who do the fancy little letter A. You might have the people who do the circle and the line. You might have people who go like that. These are three completely different looks, but they're all the same letter. And that is what is so fascinating to me about typography is the personality that goes into typography. I had to do, for my final typography project, I had to pick a person. I picked Lucille Ball and I had to pick a font. I ended up choosing the Rambler because it was a script font. It was kind of elegant, but with the thickness of the strokes, it didn't have a ton of contrast. So because it didn't have a ton of contrast, I felt like it wasn't taking itself too seriously. 
And I struggled with this project, and part of it was because I was trying to make all these funky shapes and swirls and stuff whenever I was using the font to build the picture of Lucille Ball. But being a script font, script fonts do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. They already have their extra swashes and their legs and their fancy curves and stuff that you don't have in block text. And because the font gets more complex, you don't want the design to be as complex. This is very basic. I mean, of course, once you know the rules of typography, you're welcome to break them. But these are just some examples of some things that I've learned. Um, I don't think I'm going to go too much into the actual anatomy of letters here because there's a lot of it. Just some basics on font here. You have ascenders and descenders. So here's the letter D, here's the letter P. This is an ascender because this is kind of the basic size of all the letter forms, where they all go, and this goes above that. So that stroke on the D is going to be an ascender. This stroke on a lowercase p is going to be a descender. It is going b below this basic line set that we have built for these letter forms. See that? Um, strokes, or not strokes, stress is something that's also very interesting. I'm going to have to put a picture up on the screen of stress because um, it's hard to do it with drawing, but stress is often shown to us in textbooks through the letter O, especially the capital letter O. You'll have it kind of leaning in different ways. You'll have the thickness and the thinness of the O on different sides of it, slightly different placements to kind of show is the letter just like straight up and down? Is it leaning more to the left? Is it leaning more to the right? That's, that's what stress shows. We see a lot of difference with stuff like stress in writing. So a lot of people print pretty straight, like up and down printing. Whereas whenever you do cursive, you might do it at more of a slant. So that's gonna have some more stress to it. Letters also have shoulders, just like people do. So we're going to illustrate a lowercase m here. This is a shoulder. You see that? Think of what my shoulders look like where it kind of slopes down. This is a shoulder. Some letters have some really sharp shoulders too. I think it's got a slightly different name. I'm not entirely sure what it is. But regardless, this is a shoulder. Also, legs. You ever dance the YMCA? YMCA? These are the legs of the letter Y. Yes, the legs are going up in the air. Whatever, they're still called legs. Um, the letter G, the letter G is really interesting. <laughs> As you can see, I can talk about typography forever. Letter G in typing is usually done with these two circles instead of just the basic one that we do. This is called an ear. G's have little ears. Maybe you can hang a little dot earring on that ear. Have fun with it. But these are just... <laughs> some basics about letter forms. I feel like I need to quit while I'm ahead because I could talk about this for actual hours. One more thing I do feel that I should point out though is lorem ipsum. I had a friend ask me once, who the hell is lorem ipsum? Let me tell you, lorem ipsum is not a person. Lorem ipsum is a placeholder font. Almost everyone who has been taught to read will have experienced placeholder text, but they might not know what placeholder text is. It's essentially some Latin ramblings that don't mean anything, that are put into a text box in place of the text that you will actually put in there later. So whenever you create a text box and it fills with a bunch of letters that say lorem ipsum something something something, that's just kind of showing you the size of the text, the placement of it. You're going to see the leading and the kerning of that text, and then you're going to go in and actually, you know, my Word document wrote this placeholder text in Calibri. I don't really want to write in Calibri. I actually have to write in Times New Roman. So before you even start typing, you might change that placeholder text to Times New Roman. And you will see, as you watch it, the change between Calibri and Times New Roman, between the kerning and the serifs and the leading. And you're like, oh, this looks really nice. And then you just hit backspace on all of that placeholder text, and then you have your blank box where you start typing stuff. Lorem ipsum is a huge part of typography, and you should know about it. That 
I guess it's gonna be it for me. Like I said, I could talk about this for hours. I, I love typography so much and I wanna do a bookish video series on it because I think it's gonna be fascinating and for all of the bookish nerds that we have out here on BookTube, we don't really talk about font that much. And I think we should because it's really important to the psychology of reading. So please, like, subscribe, be my friend on social media, nerd out with me about typography. Let me know what you think of typography down below. I'm so excited to start talking about this. I hope all of you have an amazing day. Bye friends. See you in my next video.